Hi everyone, welcome to um, the next talk in the um, Obstetrics and Gynaecology Patient Blood Management mini tutorial series, which is on intravenous iron. We're going to briefly cover the basics of uh, intravenous iron, what you should know, um, how it works, and the ph pharmacology adverse effects and how to talk to a patient about it um, and get consent. So let's get on with it. So the first thing you need to know is just a little bit of basic pharmacology. You can't infuse intravenous iron uh, in an unbound form. It is highly toxic. Um, it oxidizes um, the molecules and therefore it is always infused in a, as a colloid and uh, encapsulated in a large molecule like a spheroidal carbohydrate. This is the same way that the human body um, manages iron as well as you know ferritin and transferrin are large protein molecules which encapsulate the iron to prevent it from causing any damage. Many of the pharmacological um, variations that you find with these different intravenous iron preparations are due to the differences in the properties of this encapsulating molecule you know, of the, ca the carbohydrate. Very basically there's a wide range of different preparations around the world um, there's only a few in Australia and we'll go over those in a second basics are that the high molecular weight uh, molecules bind the iron quite tightly meaning that there is little free iron released and you can give the, the patient the total dose of iron that they need in one infusion. S other preparations have smaller molecules surrounding the iron which means there is some, some free iron released limiting the total dose you can give during each infusion and m usually means that um, patients have to come back for more than one infusion so they're not used that often anymore in Australia. Let's just briefly discuss, discuss again who should we consider intravenous iron for. Um, the huge majority of them fall into these two categories. One where you need a rapid effect um, so oral iron will work um, in some patients but usually takes a couple of months to fully re replete everything or even longer so if you need if that um, need an effect quicker than that then intravenous iron will do things a bit quicker usually a couple of weeks um, some patients obviously cannot tolerate intravenous uh, sorry oral iron um, due to side effects they may have a psychosocial situation where compliance over a long period of time is unlikely to be accomplished um, so those patients or may benefit from intravenous iron and certainly patients who have a high hepcidin state or an inflammatory condition the iron that is taken orally is sometimes not transferred into the body. Please refer back to the iron physiology talk where we go over hepcidin and ferroportin uh, and explain this. So basically high levels of hepcidin decrease the amount of ferroportin which means that the iron from the gut is not transported across into the, into the body and so it's not absorbed. These are patients with inflammatory conditions, post-surgery, cancer, renal impairment, etc. All right, formulations in Australia. There are three available, although only two that are commonly used. The most commonly used and the one that's been around the longest is iron polymaltose. When it was first introduced in the 60s, it was primarily given intramuscularly, and that's why they come as um, small 100 milligram ampules, which make, makes it a bit of a pain to to draw up the 1000 to 1500 milligrams when you give it as an infusion. Um, traditionally it was given over five hours but much more common nowadays in most units or hospitals and institutions around Australia to be given over 60 to 90 minutes. And we did a study in 100 gynaecology patients um, where it was given in theatre um, over 15 minutes showing there was no real problem giving it over that period of time. Similar to the same sort of speed in which carboxymaltose is given. The main advantage is that it is fairly well tolerated with very low incidence of side effects and is very cheap. Approximately $40 for 1,000 milligrams in most hospitals. Iron carboxymaltose, a similar, a similar preparation in that it is a large molecule and you can give pretty close to a total dose infusion of about 1,000 milligrams. It's been around for about five or six years now in Australia, although longer in, in parts of Europe. It is licensed uh, to be given over 15 to 30 minutes to people who come and sit in the outpatient infusion clinics and that is the reason why it is used for um, the majority of those patients in most units. Uh, it is approximately $300 for a thousand milligrams, so about 10 times more expensive, although with PBS funding from the federal government um, that makes that um, much less of an issue nowadays. Finally, just mentioning iron sucrose which is a 
a very um, uh, well do um, studied preparation which has been around a long time is thought to be incredibly safe um, unfortunately you, you can only give um, smaller doses so most people need re recurrent doses and you know, sometimes up to three to six infusions so it's not used very often anymore <coughs> but was the traditional one used when other people when um, they had a no analogy to polymaltose all right adverse effects and toxicity so uh, talk about mainly uh, the infusion reactions there are some delayed reactions which we'll talk about later so the things that people worry about obviously um, when they're discussing intravenous iron and consenting a patient to it is anaphylaxis so what is the real incidence of a serious life-threatening anaphylactic reaction um, there's a little bit of um, an association in people's minds of anaphylaxis with intravenous iron and most of that is because of the old preparation which is no longer available in Australasia um, of iron dextran which did have a high incidence of anaphylaxis. The modern ones which I've just, I've just described to you now are thought to be very safe in this respect and although they're not, the risk of um, hypersensitivity reaction is not zero, it is very low. Um, have a look at this paper from the British Journal of Pharmacology published very recently. It talks about hypersensitivity reactions to intravenous iron and it compares it to other common drugs. You'll see that um, the high risk drugs, are, and this is classified as where the risk of a serious reaction is 1 to 10 percent, um, includes something like penicillin, which is administered quite liberally in uh, label ward in um, many places, um, and some other uh, immunoglobulin treatments. Um, whereas the intravenous iron preparations that are used um, around the world now are thought to fall into the low or very low category, and these are so. Uh, um, so they're thought to be very safe. So when talking to a patient, I certainly say to them, you know, the chance of a serious adverse reaction to intravenous iron is much less than penicillin and much less than blood, where there is a quite a high incidence of things like pulmonary edema from Taco and Trali, um, hemolytic reactions, um, febrile reactions, etc. Important um, adverse event, which is important that you mention when you're talking to patients, is the risk of extravasation. So if any of the intravenous iron preparation um, enters the tissues from a, an, an IV cannula that is leaking, it can cause serious uh, semi-permanent staining of the skin. I have seen a couple of patients in follow who on follow-up told me they, a couple of years down the track, most of the stain is gone, but certainly this is a pretty serious event. It's important to make sure if you're involved in the administration of intravenous iron that you um, check the cannula with a clear solution like Ceylon or something like that first, make sure it's not leaking, there's no pain, and there is um, um, therefore a much less likelihood of this um, event occurring. Um, but it is important to mention it to patients. Fish pain reaction is again, it was also another acute reaction which is very rare but is um, described in the literature and I've seen it a few times. Named after Dr. Fishbane, if you're wondering where that name's from. He was a nephrologist in the North America um, who published it uh, in a journal and basically it's an acute pain in your chest or back um, uh, during an infusion it's thought to be a musculoskeletal reaction um, but it can be quite distressing to patients and staff who are administering the infusions um, you know, a pain in the chest is often um, a concerning symptom um, usually the treatment involves ceasing the, re, uh, the infusion it usually stops um, it's not a complete contraindication to continuing the infusion because a few times um, I have, we have continued it afterwards and it hasn't recurred. Um, but you should certainly um, think twice about that and, and um, evaluate the necessity for them to have the intravenous iron. It's not thought to be a hypersensitivity type reaction, um, so uh, it's unclear exactly what the mechanism is though. Common adverse effects, so these can occur during the infusion but often for the next couple of days after an infusion so it's important to let people know that these can occur. Patients can just feel generally a bit flu-like, they have myalgia, feel maybe a bit of nausea, a bit of headache, metallic taste, rash, all of these things can occur. Most of the time it's pretty mild in, re in response to sort of uh, rest and a bit of Panadol, that sort of thing. <coughs> there might be some evidence that corticosteroids ameliorate this a little um, somewhat so uh, although that hasn't been well studied now this is important cautions and contraindications so should 
there is um, theoretical and probably some actual evidence that um, iron and certainly intravenous iron can support the growth of bacteria um, both in um, vitro and in vivo so uh, it is c sensible to avoid giving intravenous iron infusion to someone who has a um, active bacterial infection and if they do need the intravenous iron because they can't tolerate for example oral iron um, it would be more sensible to schedule that at a later date when the concerns regarding the infection have resolved it's not an absolute contraindication, obviously, but um, there may be some life-threatening situations where people who refuse blood uh, products, for example, might it might be the benefit uh, uh, overweighs the risk. But I think in general you should always avoid it. Definitely, um, first trimester of pregnancy, like most medications, you should probably have, you should try and avoid asthma. That's this is a caution. Um, many asthmatics who don't have, you know. Um, strong history of drug reactions and it's nice and stable have had uh, intravenous iron and doesn't seem to be any problems and there's a bit of literature on that but you know all these other things that are listed here are listed on the con the uh, cautions in the drug insert and you should be careful about using it in the people with auto active autoimmune disease active inflammatory renal and liver disease um, all of these are cautions. In fact, most people with, with chronic renal impairment get um, intravenous iron with, as part of their erythropoid and ther therapy. A acute blood loss. Just want to briefly mention this. I'm not going to go into great detail, but um, there are about 11 studies now looking at the use of intravenous iron for the treatment of postpartum anemia. And many of them use um, blood loss as their inclusion criteria, including this really recent one published this year. Have a read of it. Um, they showed that there was a superior um, patient-centered outcomes, including um, fatigue and uh, laboratory parameters, which are not um, uh, the primary outcome. Um, and so just remember, um, I cast your mind back to the physiology talk, that most of the iron in your body is in your blood. If you lose a large volume of blood um, during childbirth, then you have an acute iron loss so that's the theory behind that and that's the reason why the, um, this uh, has been studied in that population um, final slide this is just to pique your interest but intravenous iron is used for a range of other things including heart failure there's some there's some evidence that um, it improves myocardial function and it's used in uh, functional iron deficiency where uh, in particular patients who are on erythropoietin all right I hope you found that useful gives you a good mental model about how to frame when intravenous iron is, should be used, how, how you should um, discuss it uh, when consenting a patient. Next up we're going to talk about intrapartum and intraoperative strategies to minimise blood loss. Hopefully um, you'll find that useful as well. Uh, so thanks for listening and um, see you again next time. Okay.